Nothing, just cleaning up a little. Wow. <laughs> what are we going to do with that? Well, I want to welcome, first of all, all of our campuses, our Hastings, our Cottage Grove, our Egan and Woodbury campuses. Good to have you along as we launch into this brand new series. I don't know about you, but I grew up singing that little song. That little song, the B-I-B-L-E, yes, that's the book for me, was something that we sang um, in what we called Sunday school in the church that I grew up in. But it wasn't just that little song that we sang. We also had a saying about the B-I-B-L-E that was repeated over and over and over and over and over and over and over again. And it was right here. The Bible says it, we believe it, and that settles it. You almost had to say it with an attitude. The Bible says it, we believe it, and that settles it. And we heard that often. And that's all I needed as a kid growing up in the church. All I needed was an adult telling me that the Bible says it, we believe it, and that settles it. Don't question the Bible. Don't put your hand up and ask any questions. No, 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 no. And if anybody gets in your face and challenges you about the authority or the trustworthiness of the Bible, our mantra, what we were programmed to say was, the Bible says it, we believe it, and that what? Say it out loud. That settles it. Yeah. And that works for a while. That works for a while. That works for a while until we actually grow up. It works for a while until we actually crack open the B-I-B-L-E and start reading it. Not just the sanitized Sunday school passages in the Bible, but a lot of the stuff in the Bible, especially in the Old or Testament, that is problematic for us. It works for us until we, we get to college or we get off to a, a university and, and very, very wise professors and teachers begin to point out things in the Bible that we never even heard about that were in the Bible when we were in church. The, the passages that nobody talked about. And all of a sudden these professors and, and these very, very wise people start poking holes in the Bible. And then that doesn't work anymore, does it? It just doesn't work anymore to say, well, the Bible says that we believe it and that's settled. It doesn't work anymore. At least it doesn't work for many of us, for many of you. Do you ever wonder why so many young people walk away from the Bible? Why so many young adults walk away from the church, from the faith, and just say, I'm, d I'm done with it? And do you ever wonder why so many atheist groups right now, and there's a bunch of them, are actually on their advertisements saying things like this, the fastest way for a Christian to become an atheist is to read the Bible. I didn't make that up. That's their slogan. Why is that so? Why are they saying that? And why are so many young people, so many young adults, walking away from the Bible? And, and the answer is, and the exact reason why we're putting the, we put this series together. Because we don't have a grown-up understanding of the Bible. We don't. And when we don't have a grown-up understanding of the Bible, when people start poking holes in the Bible or slamming the things in the Bible or even ourselves as we start reading things that are problematic in the Bible, what do we do? <laughs> we walk away, and I would argue that we walk away unnecessarily. 
And that's why for the next four weeks, uh, we are going to, we're going to put our big boy pants on and our big girl pants on. And we're going we're gonna to go a little deeper um, into this book. I, I think part of the problem, I think part of the problem is that we don't really understand the story of the Bible. That's one of the problems. And that's what a, a grown-up understanding the Bible is going to give us. We don't really understand the story of the Bible. We know a bunch of stories, right? We've all heard a bunch of stories in the Bible. But to really understand what the story is, is problematic to us. The, the other problem, I think, is we don't really understand how this Bible came to be, right? I mean, if I stopped right now and surveyed all of our campuses, and said, how'd this book, how'd this Bible come to be? Well, I, don't, I don't know. Did it, did it just drop from heaven, you know, leather bound with book titles and chapters and verses and with your name engraved in gold letters on the cover. Is that what happened? Well, no, not really. In fact, I want to get to that uh, today. I want, I want to talk about what the big story is, but I also want to talk about how, how we got our, our Bible. Uh, because because the, the truth is, the, the, the truth is, you need to probably just understand how the Bible came to be, is we didn't really even have a Bible until about 386 A.D., a guy named... Chrysostrom uh, got together with some other church leaders and for the very, very first time, what Chrysostom and these church leaders did is they took what we would call the Hebrew scriptures, the Old Testament, Genesis through Malachi, and they took the gospels, Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John, and then they took the epistles, which are all the letters to all the early church, uh, churches that were founded. And for the very first time in 386, 386 AD, keep in mind, 386 AD, for the very, very first time, they put this thing together and we have what was called Tabiblia or the Bible. Now I want you to think about that. That we didn't have a Bible. You know, we can sing the song all you want, the B-I-B-L-E, yes, that's the book for me. But we didn't even have this book until 386 A.D. And for those of you who are caffeinated, you know who you are. Go ahead and lift your cups at all of our campuses. My people. Yeah, for those of you who are caffeinated, for those of you who walked in with your, your thinking caps on, maybe you're thinking right now, hmm, Christianity existed for over 300 years without the Bible. Yes. Yes. Christianity existed for over 300 years before Tabiblia, the Bible, ever was put together. You need to understand this, friend, that the, the, the Bible did not found Christianity. The, the, Bi the Bible didn't start or create Christianity. Christianity was already in existence for over 300 years before there was a Bible. In fact, Christianity, this movement called Christianity, grew its fastest by hundreds of thousands of people before this book was ever put together. You say, well, that's kind of interesting. So why then, why then did this thing called Christianity get birthed? And why did this thing called Tabiblia, the Bible, get collected, formed, and put together? Why, 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 why? And here's the answer right here. Because something happened in Jerusalem around 30 AD. A guy named Jesus predicted his death and resurrection, and he pulled it off in front of hundreds of, of people. Yeah, that's the answer. Because from that point on, from 30 AD on, all of a sudden, what Jesus had said and done took on whole new meaning. All of a sudden, what Jesus had said and what Jesus had done after 30 AD, after this event that happened in Jerusalem, all of a sudden, people took note in a big way of this Jesus person. Multitudes start to follow him. People are willing to lay their lives down. They're, they're, they're willing to die to say, yeah, I saw him dead on a cross. I saw him buried in a tomb. And, and I, then I saw him alive. Three days later, people gave their life for that. And from that point on also, after 30 AD, all of a sudden people got papyrus. And they started writing down the things that Jesus said and the things that Jesus did. They started writing things down and collecting these things and preserving these things. 
In fact, a guy by the name of Luke was one of the guys who started to write things down for a guy by the name of Theophilus. Luke was a, a first century doctor, a physician. And Theophilus was a, a very wealthy, uh, first century, uh, successful kind of businessman. And, and Theophilus actually hires Luke to write an orderly account of this Jesus person. And Luke does it. And what Luke wrote down and collected and put together has made its way into our B-I-B-L-E. We call it the book of, oh, you're so wise. Yes, we call it the book of Luke. And in fact, if you want to grab a B-I-B-L-E and open it up to Luke, uh, I want to show you what Luke says about his mission. This is Luke chapter 1. And if you don't want to open up a Bible, that's okay. I'll have it on my, my friend over here, the TV. But Luke chapter 1, Luke tells us, this physician tells us what his whole thing was. Here's what Luke writes. Luke chapter 1. He says, many people, many people, not just him, but in the first century world after Jesus rose from the grave, many people set out to write accounts about the events that have been fulfilled among us. Now we're going to stop right here. And this is my parentheses. This is not in the Bible. But I'm, I'm trying to explain the events. The events including the event of all events. In other words, something happened through this Jesus guy that all of a sudden now was worth documenting. By the way, you need to understand, friends, in the first century world, there were a lot of would-be messiahs. There were a lot of people showing up on the scene saying, I'm the messiah. No, I'm the messiah. No, I'm the messiah. And they all were would-be disciples and then all the would-be messiahs. And all of a sudden someone came saying, I'm the messiah. And then they died and they rose from the grave. And like, yep, yep, he is the messiah. And from that moment on, people started writing things down. Now picking up, back up what Luke said. They used the eyewitness reports circulating among us from the early disciples. Having carefully investigated everything from the beginning, I, Luke, Luke, the, do the doctor guy, I have decided to write an accurate account for you most honorable Theophilus so you can be certain and other people can be certain of the truth of everything that you were taught. Now you need to understand. Everybody look at me for a second. All of our campuses. Luke, when he starts writing this orderly account of the life and the teachings of Jesus, he never in a million years was thinking, sweet, I get to write a book of the Bible. Because he had no idea about a Bible. He didn't even think that there would ever be a Bible. He had no idea but that someday that this book would be put together. Actually, it's a collection of books. It's more like a library than a book. He, he never had any idea that someday 100 million copies per year of this book would be sold. He had no idea. All he knew was that something happened that was very profound in Jerusalem around 30 A.D., that a guy actually claiming to be the Messiah proved that he was indeed the Messiah. So why is there a Bible? The answer is because Jesus rose from the dead. If Jesus had not risen, if Jesus had stayed buried in the tomb, nobody would have written anything down. No, nobody would have all of a sudden you know, started documenting and collecting and, uh, and, and, and interviewing eyewitnesses and saying, okay, what'd you see? What'd you see? What'd you see? And writing, no, that would never have happened. No one would have documented the unbelievable explosion of this movement that we now call Christianity. And no one, no one would have taken the Hebrew scriptures. No one would have taken the Hebrew scriptures that we call the Old Testament and, and all of a sudden put them together with what we call the New Testament. No one would have done that. No one would have, would have done that. But they did it because of the Old Testament. And we're going to talk about this next weekend at Crossroads. But the Old Testament, what it does is it, it anticipates. It, it points toward Jesus. And that's why all of a sudden this, this, the Hebrew scriptures all of a sudden became very important as well. But no resurrection. Let's get back to this. No resurrection would mean no Bible. No church and no spread of Christianity. But because of this event, we end up, this is how we got our Bible. We end up with 66 books, which we call the Bible. It, 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 it's fascinating how it all came to be. And what is the story of the Bible? Pastor Phil, can you, can you sum up the story of the Bible in one word? Of course I can. It's Jesus. Because the Old Testament, 
I've already said this, anticipates Jesus and the New Testament introduces us to Jesus. The Old Testament says, points toward a Messiah who is going to come. And then the New Testament introduces us to that Messiah and then this movement that he started. Now I want you to hear this. Our faith is not dependent upon whether or not a real guy named Adam and a real guy named Eve existed. I'm not saying they didn't. I'm just saying our faith is not dependent upon whether you can prove that the first man and the first woman were Adam and Eve. Our our faith is not dependent upon whether or not the earth is 6,000 years old or it's 4.5 billion years old. Our faith isn't dependent upon figuring that the age of the earth. Our faith is not dependent upon whether or not we we believe that a guy held up a, a staff or a rod and a sea split in two. Our faith is not dependent upon whether or not there was a real guy named Jonah who got swallowed by a big, big whale. It's a whale of a tail. Our faith is not dependent upon whether or not that literally happened or not. Our faith is not dependent upon whether or not Genesis 1 and 2 is good science or bad science. Our faith is not dependent upon whether or not the Bible contains good history or bad history. Now, I have my opinion on all that stuff. And you have your opinion on all that stuff. But what I'm saying to you is our faith, our faith is dependent on one thing and only one thing, an event called the resurrection. Did Jesus Christ raise from the dead? Did he rise up after being buried in a tomb for over three days? Because that's what our faith is based on. And if he didn't come back from the dead, then why in the world did this thing called Christianity explode after 30 AD? I mean, what what would their motivation be to follow a liar who said he was going to die and raise and he never did? And why in the world, all of a sudden, if he, didn't, if he didn't come back to life, why all of a sudden did his followers, why, why, why did they go to their grave saying, no, we saw a resurrected Jesus with our own eyes. Why were they willing to be burned at a stake? Why were they willing to be fed to lions? Why were they willing, think about this, to be crucified upside down? Why were they willing to die the most horrific death if he stayed in a grave? And, and, and why, why, why do we have this book even if it's based on a lie? Why, why would anybody start collecting and writing down and preserving the things that Jesus said? Why, why did credible historians, not Christian historians, no, 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 no. Why did credible first century historians like Tacitus and Pliny the Younger And Josephus, why did these very credible historians who weren't Christians, why all of a sudden did they write in their historical accounts about Jesus and this explosion, this movement that happened in the first time? If if it's all a lie, why did all of that happen? And the answer, of course, is there's only one answer, that something did happen. Something did happen. Jerusalem, in 30 AD, a guy did predict his death and resurrection, and he pulled it off. All right, take another sip. Because here's what I want to say to you. I will acknowledge to you right now that there's a, there's a lot of things in the B-I-B-L-E that are really, really hard to understand. There's a lot of confusing things in the Bible. And, and if you've ever tried to read through the, the Hebrew, the Old Testament, you, you know that there's not just confusing things in the Bible. There's a lot of very cruel things in the Bible. There, there, are, there are things that we read and we go, I can't believe that's in the Bible. And I, I can't believe that that's something that God would actually call his people to do. And I just want to acknowledge that with you. 
And, and I will also want you to know that in week three of this series, we're going to hit those things. We're going to talk about the cruelty. We're going to talk about a lot of that stuff that you don't read about in Sunday school. A lot of that stuff that we, most churches never, ever open their mouth and really talk openly about. We're going to do it together week three. So come on back. But, but I, I don't want you to miss the story. In the midst of all those problematic things that we maybe have seen in the Bible or heard about that are in the Bible, I don't want us to miss the story. Because the story, yeah, there are parts of the story that are problematic. Yeah, 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 yeah. But the story, the story is all about Jesus. And I want you to hear that again and again and again. The story of the Bible, the bigger story is Jesus. And that's why the Old Testament points to Jesus and the New Testament introduces us to Jesus. Jesus. Don't miss that point. Don't miss the bigger story, which is Jesus. Why did Jesus come? To give us a crystal clear picture of what God the Father is really like. You want to know what God the Father is really like? Look at Jesus. Because he came and he said, hey, <laughs> I'm here to show you the Father. He, he came to show us with crystal clarity what, what the Father's like. And he didn't come just to show us what the Father, what God's like. He came to sacrifice his life on a cross to die for my sins and your sins so that we could have life in all of its fullness. And not just abundant life, but so we could experience eternal life with him forever and ever and ever. But we get so tripped up, don't we? We get, some of us get so tripped up in some of the problematic things in the Bible that we don't see the bigger story of the Bible. Now, what I'm going to say right now you cannot be repeated outside of any of our campuses. <laughs> All of our campuses do this right now. I'm looking at you, Egan, Hastings, Cottage Grove, Woodbury. Do Everybody do this, okay? Now, you can't repeat what I'm going to say right now, but here, here, here's the deal. You could actually eliminate, you could like cut out the entire Old Testament and you'd still have the story. You'd still have Jesus. You would still have his life, his death, his resurrection. Now, I'm not saying to do this because the Old Testament is very important because it is, it is the back, it's like two thirds of our body. It's the back story. It anticipates, it points to Jesus. But you could, you could, you could cut it out. Don't do this, but you could. <laughs> you still have the story. Because you'd still have the hero of the story. You'd still have the main character of the story, which is Jesus. And some of you, let's just be honest, some of you at some of our campuses, you've given up on the Bible because of that stuff that you read in the Old Testament. And you know what I'm talking about. You, you, you've given up because of this, <clears throat> the science in Genesis 1 and 2. It, you, cannot, you cannot reconcile it with what you know. And so you've given up on the Bible. Or you've given up on the Bible because of all the, and there's a lot of them, stone the sinner passages. You've given up on the Bible because of God's command to the Israelites to go and utterly annihilate the Canaanites and other enemies. Utterly annihilate them. Kill the men, the women, the children, and all the animals. And we go, what? What? How could that, how could that, how could that be in the Bible? How could God have really, did God, how could God have said that? Come back in week three. But that, that's the challenge. And we're, we're going to get to some of those things. But, but you need to know, you need to know, you need to know that our faith is not dependent upon whether or not we can adequately navigate through all of those challenging passages in the Bible. No, our faith is based on a person named Jesus who was the Messiah, who died, who was resurrected three days later. That, that's what it's based on. So, um, so... So, we're just getting kicked off here. <laughs> you going to come back for week two, by the way? I hope you do. In week three, I know you're going to come back for as you, you watch me sweat uh, on here. But he, here's the deal. I have an assignment for, for a small group of you, uh, just a small group of you, and that's okay. 
I, I want you for the next 30 days to read through the Gospel of John. For the next 30 days, just read through the Gospel of John. Why the Gospel of John? Because John was an eyewitness. He was an eyewitness to the life of Jesus. He was there. He was there and later in his life, he writes this, this account of the life of Jesus. Now, I want you to know something. This assignment is not for those of you who are already reading through the Bible. Do you know that 1,400 adults have already committed to reading through the Bible this year? Either the entire Bible or the New Testament? Unbelievable. That's mind blown. I, I'm so proud of those of you who are doing that. I applaud you. You keep doing what you're doing. No, I want this assignment, read through the Gospel of John for, for two groups of people. For those of you who have maybe tried to read it and, and you, you gave up on it, or if you've never ever really opened up the Bible and read it, this assignment is for you. I want you in the next 30 days to simply read through the gospel of John. One, less than one chapter a day. It's doable. And I want you to do it again because John was an eyewitness. In fact, John, at the end of this book that he wrote on Jesus' life, he gives us the why. He says, but these things I've written you, they're written so that you may continue to believe or, or, or you may start to believe that Jesus is the Messiah, the Son of God, and that by believing in him, you will have life by the power of his name. I want you, if you've never read the Bible or you've given up or walked away or semi walked away from the Bible, I want you to read the Gospel of John because maybe, maybe, just maybe, Jesus is the Messiah. Maybe, just maybe, he is the Son of God. Maybe, just maybe, there is life found in him. So for no other reason, you need to cover your bases. So I want you, if you're not reading the Bible, to join many of us in reading through the gospel of John. Read it. Just read it. And, and get to know Jesus. And then, after you read it, for 30 days, you read the Gospel of John, and at the end of 30 days, Jesus has no interest to you. At the end of 30 days, as you've honestly read through with integrity the Gospel of John, and Jesus does not intrigue you in the least, and after 30 days of reading through the, the life and teachings of Jesus, you have no interest whatsoever in investigating Jesus any further, then I would say, walk away. Walk away. But don't walk away. Don't walk away unnecessarily. Don't walk away until you honestly take some time to read through the gospel of John. It's Jesus. Jesus is what it's all about. And Jesus is the hero of the story and Jesus is the reason for the story. So, take the challenge. At all of our campuses this weekend, we're giving away free copies of the Gospel of John for those who are taking the challenge. And your campus pastor will tell you more about that. But for now, um, I have the privilege of praying for you and praying for me as we begin this journey together. God, thank you so much for this time that we get to spend thinking through things that matter and, and Father God, I pray for myself and I pray for all who are tuning in to this message, this series. Would you give us insight, spirit of the living God? Would you give us understanding to grasp your story better and to find you and to find ourselves in your story? And we thank you so much Father, for sending us Jesus, your son, so that we could have a clear, clear, clear picture of who you are and what you're really like. And my prayer on behalf of all of the Crossroads family is that our faith would grow. Our faith would grow in these weeks to come. 
you would give us a grown-up understanding of your amazing story. And we pray this together in your name. Amen.